Now I hope that you got a bulletin today and I hope that in your bulletin today there is a blank sheet of paper because I really, really hope that today you will take some notes. I have some, I hope, <laughs> a lot of hope here. I hope I have some very useful and practical outlines that you will find of not only interest but find of use both with your children and with your grandchildren and those of you who are children someday if the Lord tarries and gives you a family you'll have these notes that you will have saved and be able to look back on them and I hope lots of hope here uh, hope that you will be able to then use them a generation from now we're over in Proverbs chapter 22 looking at verse 6 train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it our gracious Heavenly Father we pray that you might cause us to learn biblical wisdom today wisdom that is practical not merely things that are interesting not merely a collection of facts giving us head knowledge but things that we can put into practice even this very week your word is practical it's quick it's powerful it's sharper than any two-edged sword it pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart and so father we pray that you will take your word today that you will use it in the lives of all of us including this preacher so that we might be more faithful in our service to the Lord Jesus Christ we pray these things in Jesus name Amen. Parents Day. Now I know the rest of the world is not celebrating Parents Day, but we missed it here, so we're celebrating Parents Day here today. And uh, for that, we are looking at some very important passages in the book of Proverbs. Now we just read Proverbs chapter 22 a moment ago. The book of Proverbs was designed by God as a child instruction manual for the purpose of teaching character, wisdom, and life goals. The book of Proverbs deals with everything from salvation to the moment of death, from energy to eternity, from courtship to business relationships, from sloth to sex, from pride to poverty, from political astuteness in times of peace to dealing with enemies in times of war, from interpersonal relationships in friendship to discerning the wrong kinds of friends, from money to morals, from priorities to posterity. There is no area of human life that Proverbs does not touch upon. Proverbs tells you how to prepare for life, how to live life, and how to die. Training children in all of these areas is what a parent must do for his children to fulfill the divine command, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. This is not optional for parents. This is a command with a promise. Did you catch that? If the children depart when they are old, we have failed to obey what God commanded. We've not done our job. Now there may be some intermediate rebellion, but the promise is concerning how they will end their lives. If they end their lives outside the ways of God, we did not do what God wanted us to do. In Scripture, God gives many commands that always have a direct correlation and a direct impact on the results. That's a New Testament principle as well. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6, again dealing with children and parents, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother. Now listen to this next phrase, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest live long on the earth. Results are tied to what we do. And verse 4, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Did you know that that word nurture actually is a word for spanking? A very, very hard spanking? Now you've heard me say before, and if I live you'll probably hear me say it again, 
There are three areas of child training that are absolutely essential for raising children. It's like a three-legged stool. You have to have all three legs. Number one, I hope you're taking notes if you haven't gotten this before, the three areas of child training. Number one, instruction. Number two, discipline. Number three, example. Let me just give you a brief description of each of those. Instruction is teaching your children the rules, that is, the, way, the ways of God for living a life that is pleasing to Him. Teaching them the ways of God that is living a life pleasing to Him. Number two, discipline. That not only means insisting that your child follow certain patterns and habits of life, but it also includes corporal punishment when the little rascal is disobedient, stubborn, and recalcitrant. Who are you children listening? I'm telling your parents God said they're supposed to spank you. Number three, example. Example means you must personally know what the Bible tells you, what you must do. Example means you must know what the Bible tells you that you must do. And then you must publicly, privately, and consistently do it so that your children and grandchildren have a role model to follow. You now, Christian parents often personally rebel in at least two of those areas, in the areas of discipline and example. We as Christian parents often rebel. In the area of discipline, they've been deceived by the Dr. Spock people, the Spockian modern psychology that says you must never spank your kid or you will warp his little ciche. The modernist crowd merely wants you to reason with him like you would reason with a thoughtful adult. The problem is a child is not an adult. And he doesn't think like an adult who can rationally weigh beneficial and negative outcomes in the undefined future. He lives in the present. Besides, it really doesn't matter what pop psychology says if the God who made your child tells you to do something different. On that is issue of discipline, some parents have not been deceived, but they've been intimidated by the draconian legal morass of child protective services that calls all child spanking child abuse. Other Christian parents are simply lazy and would rather not confront the strong-willed little rebel. They would rather ignore the little brat so that they can lounge on the couch eating chocolates while they watch their daily soap operas or chat on the phone with their friends sharing all the latest juicy go gossip circulating at the church. That's the area of discipline, but let's go on to example. What are you personally doing? What are you personally doing? Not talking about what are you doing. Both positive and negative. There are far too many Christian parents and grandparents who say, in effect, do what I say, not what I do. If that's how you live, you're a hypocrite. Now, don't get all hot and bothered at me. Jesus called the hypocrites hypocrites, too. Let me give you some examples, since we're talking about the example that you are supposed to be setting for your children and grandchildren, and all the young people you deal with, for example, even in summer Bible school. Do you habitually show up late for church, but would never show up late for work? You're telling your children and grandchildren and other young people that work is important because you get money there, but church is not important. It's something you'd rather not have to do. Ooh, let me hit one that's very personal. <laughs> and I feel free to speak on this subject because it affects me personally, although I've never lacked in my life. How about the pastor's salary fund? When was the last time that you personally put some of your own personal money that you personally earned or got from retirement or from passive income into one of those little white envelopes that you see in the pews in front of you that have red print marked pastor's salary fund? When was the last time you did that? On July 10th, Two weeks ago, $610 came into the pastor's salary fund. Now let me tell you a, a dirty little secret. 600 of that was a donation from my uncle. 
That means that this church paid me only $10 for a week of work. Last week, July 17th, a total of $15 came into the pastor's salary fund for a week of work. You can look in your bulletin. It's printed there every week. You'll see the report. There's not one of you who would be willing to do what I do around here all week long, week after week, for 10 or $15. What that probably means is that only one person in this congregation donated to the pastor's salary fund on those two weeks, which means that the rest of you didn't. It means that you didn't pay for your food at the restaurant. It means that you paid for your own personal comfort, like the air conditioning, but you didn't pay for your food. And you wonder why the church doesn't grow. Now be an adult, confront yourself. What kind of example are you setting for your children and grandchildren? Do I care because I'm starving? No, I'm obviously overweight. But I do care because it reveals a spirit of slumber, a spirit of spiritual apathy, a spirit of covetousness, a spirit of carelessness for the things of Christ, a spirit of stubborn rebelliousness. We'll teach him a thing or two. Do you not think that you will have to give an account to God for that someday? Do you know that you are randomly throwing away eternal rewards while you hold on to temporal rubbish? Perhaps you want to argue, but it says in the bulletin that we're not behind in the pastor's salary fund, so why should I have to give to it? That's like saying, the restaurant is currently making a profit, so why should I have to pay for my meal? The reason that there's a positive balance in the pastor's salary fund, and has been for weeks, is because, you see, my uncle gave over $10,000 to that fund since he was tired of seeing it always in the red. But it's not his obligation to pay my salary. It's your obligation to pay my salary. His gifts were designed to cover legitimate shortfall after you have done your best, not to relieve you of your obligation before God. Even if every one of you had only given a dollar, that would certainly be something that you had given to the pastor's salary fund, but there were more than 10 people. What about the area of instruction? Didactic teaching is always necessary to communicate truth. <laughs> Even Jesus himself had to resort to it when he was dealing with people. But God has given a special responsibility in this area of instruction to parents that he has not given to the church or to the Christian school or to Christian camps or to Christian youth groups or to babysitters or hired tutors. God has given children to parents, not to the government or any other surrogate spoon feeder. And you cannot teach what you yourself do not personally know and practice. But you might argue, but I don't know systematic theology. Why not? Why don't you know systematic theology? You have a Bible. You quote the catechism by road every Sunday in Sunday school. Oh, I see, you don't come to Sunday school. Have you ever been to a Christian bookstore? Did you know that they carry summaries of Christian doctrine with scripture references? How much time do you personally spend every day studying the scripture? Did you know that that is your job, not just the pastor's? Instruction. You cannot teach that which you do not know. Now, don't you just hate it when I make messages apply to you personally and not just generally and vaguely apply to somebody else while you're, if you could, looked at your smartphone surfing the Internet? Instruction, discipline, example. That's the three-legged stool that absolutely cannot stand up even if one of the legs is missing. 
And so that raises the question, so what does God want us to do? Most Christian parents don't have a clue outside a vague general notion that they should probably teach the kids about Jesus and hope they get saved. You know, that's really weak. It probably means that the parent is a sloth when it comes to studying the scripture and applying it to himself or herself. Proverbs summarizes it up for us this way as it opens the book of Proverbs. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase in learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb, and the interpretation, the words of the wise, and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of the government and forsake not the law of the church. It didn't say that, did it? Hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. He starts the book and says the goal of the book is to teach wisdom and justice and judgment and equity, to give knowledge, to give discretion, to give understanding. And then he tells us who's supposed to be teaching it to the children. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. It's the parents, not the church, not the government, and not the babysitter. Not the Christian school, not the Christian camp, and not the youth group. It's the father and the mother. For they shall be an ornament of a grace unto thy head. That is, it gives beauty. And chains about thy neck. That gives restraint to keep you from evil. The book of Proverbs is designed to teach immature, foolish, selfish, hormone-driven children how to become wise, self-controlled, godly adults. It teaches boys to become godly men. In the process, it also teaches girls and parents how to choose the right kind of wise man to marry their daughters. And it teaches both boys and girls how to avoid wrong life choices that end in sorrow and destruction. Now, if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, I'm going to give you a simple kind of an outline here that you ought to write down. Proverbs has four major divisions. Four. Easy. Okay? Four basic areas of instruction. The divisions are these. First division, chapters 1 through 9. That comprises the hardware, the framework around which all of the later specific details of instructions are grouped. The rest of the book, chapters 10 and following, is the software programs that fit the framework established in chapters 1 through 9. We know how to divide the book of Proverbs because Solomon uses a key phrase to break it into four parts. He uses these words, very important, key, divisional words. There are four words. The Proverbs of Solomon. You say, wow, that's a no-brainer. You're right. But that occurs at the four basic divisions of the book. It starts the four basic divisions of the book. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 1, for example, says, a why, uh, Proverbs chapter 10 verse 1 says, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolishness is the heaviness of his mother. That's the Proverbs of Solomon. That's what that teaching started with. Look it up. Chapter 10 verse 1. That's what it said in chapter 1 verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. But when we get to chapter 10... These are the specific Proverbs given by Solomon, some of which Solomon learned from David. The general overview is given in chapters 1 through 9. Now we find the specific details followed in chapters 10 through 24 for specific life situations. 
We're put on notice that chapter 10 begins those specific individual proverbs there in verse 1 with the same divisional words that we saw in chapter 1, the Proverbs of Solomon. That brings us to the third division of the book of Proverbs, which is chapters 25 through 30. Chapters 25 through 30. Now, those of you who are sharp and can think ahead know that Proverbs only has 31 divisions. The final division is only one chapter long. But chapters 25 through 30, these are Proverbs that are taken from the judicial, administrative, and other writings of Solomon that were culled out of Solomon's writings in the days of Hezekiah. That section is also specifically separated out by its opening verse. Chapter 25, verse 1 says, These are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of King Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. That brings us to the fourth and final division of the book of Proverbs. Chapter 31. I find it fascinating that this particular chapter is the capstone chapter of wisdom for the entire book. Because it principally deals with a godly woman. You see, the woman a man marries makes all the difference in whether or not his life will be a success in the eyes of God. This chapter is God's teaching about the godly woman that Solomon learned from his mother. His mother taught him this stuff. His mother was Bathsheba. But Bathsheba is not talking about herself. She's not the example. Even though she was an extremely wise woman, remember she was the granddaughter of Ahithophel, who was David's wisest counselor prior to his adultery with Bathsheba. Instead, Bathsheba principally used Solomon's great-grandmother, Ruth, as the example of the godly woman. You've heard me preach on that on Mother's Day. For I think I adequately demonstrated that Ruth is the one who is being spoken of in Proverbs 31. She was the great grandmother of Solomon. This section is introduced at the end of chapter 30 by some rather enigmatic and prophetic words about the Word of God, both written and living. That section is also an inf official introduction that is strikingly different than the other three sections. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Here the words are called a prophecy, not a set of proverbs like in the other three divisions. Prophetically, this section tells you in advance what kind of a life a young man will have who marries the right kind of a woman. In contrast to the man who marries the wrong kind of a woman, who's warned against all the rest of the way through the book of Proverbs. It doesn't start with those same words, the Proverbs of Solomon, but it's all that you have left. It's the fourth and final division of the book. That's the four major divisions of the book of Proverbs. Now let me ask you a question. Did you know the four divisions before I told you? Did you write them down? Did you know I've told you those divisions in the past? Did you remember them? If you want to obey God in training your children and grandchildren, you should be writing down the material that I have pre-digested for you. Within these four major divisions, there are four basic areas of instruction and application. So we've got another set of fours here. Note well, there's a difference, by the way, between knowledge and wisdom in this. The accumulation of knowledge is a presupposition for each of these four areas of instruction. Knowledge deals with facts. Wisdom deals with the application of facts. In other words, Solomon assumes, through most of the book, that his son has done his homework. In other words, he's learned the facts. But raw facts are not the key issue in Proverbs. Even an idiot and a fool can know raw facts. Proverbs assumes that the young person will have learned the facts. You see, facts are the stuff of which knowledge is composed. The question in Proverbs is, how do you interpret, use, and apply the facts to real-life situations? That's wisdom. Learning facts relates to knowledge. Knowing how to apply the facts from the divine perspective is wisdom. And that's what Solomon is trying to teach his children how to do. That's what you have to do to train your children and grandchildren. 
But you know, even the wisest man on earth can have a fool for a son who failed to learn what his father taught him. That's evident from the fact that Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, was a fool, and within a, the first week of his reign, he split the kingdom because he listened to fools who were his own age rather than listening to the older men who had sat under the teaching of his father. So, the four basic areas for instruction in wisdom are laid out in Proverbs 1, verse 3. Notice that three of these areas deal specifically with leadership, law, and the principles of ruling or leading, as well as general areas of life. A man who understands these areas will be a divinely qualified leader in every sphere of authority, whether it's in the family, in the church, at work, or in the government. These principles are contrary to the world's principles of leadership. But here's the four, the four listed for you in verse 3 of chapter 1. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. We used to have courts of equity in our country. They've been merged with the courts of law now. So our courts now deal with both law and equity. We'll explain in a moment. So what do these four words mean? What are they dealing with? Because that's the way Solomon said he lays out the book of Proverbs. That's what he's trying to accomplish, is to get you to learn those four things. Number one, wisdom. Wisdom is learning to apply God's divine perspective to the facts to get God's results on life issues. Let's try it again. Wisdom is learning to apply God's divine perspective to the facts to get God's results on life issues. Number two, justice. Justice is learning to apply God's standard of righteousness to every fact pattern. That's what a judge tries to do in a court of law. He tries to apply the standard of the law, and if he's a wise judge, first with divine law, then the constitutional law of the United States, then the constitutional law of the state, and then the various rules and regulations in the statutory laws. Justice is learning to apply God's standard of righteousness to every fact pattern. The third is judgment. That's learning how to see past the smoke screens that people put up. Judgment, having sound judgment. Learning how to see past the smoke screens that people put up so that you can understand the real facts in every case and be able to tell right from wrong. Do you really know how to tell right from wrong? Learning to see past the smoke screens that people put up so that you can understand the real facts in every case and be able to tell right from wrong. The fourth area that parents must be communicating to their children is equity. When you play favorites, you are not being equitable. But it applies not merely among your children, but equity means applying equal standards to every person in every situation of life so that you don't end up playing favorites and cutting deals for the people you like while coming down hard on the people you don't like. Now, I know that's long, so I'll say it again. Equity means applying equal standards to every person in every situation of life I'll pause there. Applying equal standards to every person in every situation of life so that you don't end up playing favorites and cutting deals for the people you like while coming down hard on the people you don't like. Now, the next section is a list that I'm not quite sure I'm going to get through in the next four minutes. We're not even going to get to the main part of the message. As long as you get this bit of the outline, <laughs> I can preach the rest of the message sometime else and you'll understand it. 
because the next part has 21 pieces to it. A list of 21. They're short, but there's a list. You see, the book of Proverbs has at least 21 different areas of life. By the way, that's three times seven. God happens to like the numbers three and seven. Interesting, after studying the book of Proverbs to come up with that number. But the book of Proverbs has at least 21 different areas of life to which the four areas of instruction that I just gave to you, justice and judgment and wisdom and equity, 21 in those four areas where things are laid out. When a child learns God's ways in these areas, he's well on his way to maturity. Proper leadership in the home, proper functioning in the church, proper application of the what we call Protestant work ethic at work and properly fitting into society. When the child gets that, he's on his way to maturity, leadership in the home, church, work, society, and he's ready for marriage and fulfillment of God's goals for his life and for eternity. We obviously can't cover everything, but perhaps we can give a brief overview to show that parents have a huge job to pass all of this wisdom to the next generation. The principle, 21 different areas of life of wisdom covered by this parent to child talk include these 21 things. Number one, friends. Number one, friends. That's the first thing that Solomon talks about in chapter one. Friends. The right kind of friends, the wrong kind of friends. The areas of danger that alert you to the types of friends that they are. Number two, the wise use of money. You know, God's principles versus worldly principles. Most of Bible-believing Christians in America today function on the basis of worldly principles for money and for possessions rather than functioning on the basis of God's principles. Number three, the wise use of material goods and resources for eternal purposes. Get those last three words. Not just the wise use of material goods and resources, but the wise use of material goods and resources for eternal purposes. Number four, and here's one that is definitely lacking, certainly in our culture and to a great extent in the church, integrity integrity that means honesty truthfulness reliability strength against compromise I mean there is so much that is wrapped up in integrity look it up in the dictionary look at all the things that are listed think to yourself if I'm gonna have integrity in this situation what does this affect in my life integrity you are so consistent that you are always this way People who know you can always depend upon you. You are reliable. You are trustworthy. They poke around and can't find the holes. Number five. This is a big one in Proverbs. Knowing and doing God's will. Knowing and doing God's will. We all talk about wanting to know the will of God, but we don't study Proverbs. Proverbs tells you the will of God in the practical things of life. Knowing and doing God's will. In other words, <laughs> to do that, you have to have a right relationship with God, obviously. Number six, the wise use of skills. You know, God has not only given you spiritual gifts, God has given you talents and skills. I was once again sitting in awe and amazement yesterday as I was listening to a piece of classical music on the radio. It was an incredible symphony, a magnificent symphony. It moved me to tears. It was written by Felix Mendelssohn when he was 12 years old. 12 years old. Do you know that by the time he was 14 he had written more than 20 symphonies? 
as well as much other incidental music. That's a gift from God, people. That's a skill. The book of Proverbs has a great deal to say about the wise use of skills and it connects them to something. The issue related to diligent work. You can have skills and gifts and talents that you never develop because you are a sluggard. You make excuses. Book of Proverbs has a lot to say about the wise use of skills. Number seven, the wise use of time. The wise use of time. I'm already two minutes over, gotta move. Number eight. Oh, this is a big one, and it's a real problem in a lot of churches. Number eight, the control of the tongue. The control of the tongue. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And you're going to eat the fruit of it. That's what the book of Proverbs says. How you use your tongue is going to produce some fruit that you will have to eat. It's like the old saying, make sure that your words are sweet and kind today because tomorrow you may have to eat them. The use of the tongue. Number nine. Accountability versus excuse making. Accountability versus excuse making. We are also adept at making excuses. We don't even know when we're making excuses. All of us want to avoid accountability. We want to blame somebody else. Proverbs talks about learning to grow up and being accountable. Stop making excuses. Number 10, life perspective, what we call in our modern English vernacular, the worldview. Life perspective, your worldview. In other words, really understanding from God's perspective what is important and valuable and what is not important and valuable. Numbers 11 through 17 are what have been called the seven deadly sins. You've heard me preach an entire series on those. But Proverbs also gives you their opposite. It tells you the sin and it tells you its opposite. It tells you what you're not supposed to have and what you are supposed to have. So let me just list them, uh, list them for you quickly. These are key major areas of the book of Proverbs. Number one, this is actually number 11, but the first of the seven deadly sins. Number 11, Pride versus humility. Pride versus humility. Number 12, greed versus generosity. Greed versus generosity. Number 13, anger versus forgiveness. Anger versus forgiveness. Number 14, sloth versus diligence. Sloth versus diligence. Number 15, and you may be surprised at this contrast, but this is what you find in Proverbs. Envy versus kindness. Envy versus kindness. Number 16, gluttony versus self-control. Gluttony versus self-control. And number 17, which he probably spends more time on than all the rest. I haven't actually counted up the verses, although I've, I've divided them out this way. Lust versus love. Lust versus love. You know how much 
He talks about in Proverbs about sex, evil women, good women, how to choose a wife, marriage, moral purity, how to be a godly husband, how to be a father, how a father discerns a godly husband for his daughters, and so on. Now, there's an awful lot in the book of Proverbs. Those are the seven areas. That brings us to number seven. That's 17 of them. Number 18, the 18th area of life that Proverbs deals with is attitudes and motives. Attitudes and motives. Both good and bad. It doesn't just list the good ones or just the bad ones. It gives you both. Attitudes and motives. There are many of them dealt in Proverbs. That's a category. Number 19. <laughs> Oh, this is one you certainly see all over Proverbs. An area that is dealt with consistently and very, very emphatically. Fools. Fools. Who's a fool? Did you know that there are many different kinds of fools in Proverbs? We won't list them all here, but there are many different kinds of fools in Proverbs because different words for the different kinds of fools are used. But that's a category. Dealing with fools, you don't want to be that. Number 20, personal self-control in all situations. Personal self-control in all situations. There are many different kinds listed in Proverbs, but for example, alcohol. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. What is Proverbs trying to teach? It's trying to teach wisdom. You want to argue about your right to drink Alcoholic beverages, Proverbs tells you about that you're a fool. It says, he who, whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. You've heard me preach on that. I'll not go into it. Number 21. The third or 21st major area that Proverbs deals with is leadership character qualities. Leadership character qualities. For us in the body of Christ, that would also include things like spiritual gifts because there are spiritual gifts that relate to leadership in the church. Spiritual gifts were not given in the Old Testament. Although the Holy Spirit came upon people and gifted them for specific purposes, the Holy Spirit also left them. In the New Testament, that's not so with us. So we have more that we're responsible for than they ever had in the Old Testament period before the Holy Spirit came to permanently indwell every believer. So we have spiritual gifts as well as our natural talents, which they would have had in the Old Testament. But we also have other leadership character qualities dealt with, like alertness to opportunities, decisive action. I mean, you can go on. There's a huge gamut of these leadership character qualities. It should be self-evident that a parent must know these things before he or she can teach these things to their sons and daughters as the parent trains them and that is your job as parents and grandparents for the kind of man or woman that God wants and trains them concerning the kind of person that they should marry and for the kind of man or woman that they must avoid at all costs for a parent to teach all these things the parent must know them first and that requires diligent study that requires practical life application so that the parent can set the example for the children to follow. And so the children will know what they must look for. Did you know that's only page six out of 14 pages? But that's a great place to stop. And so remember, if you have any responsibility for children, say, well, I'm single. I never had any kids. Oh, but do you ever interact with children? How about like we just finished two weeks of summer Bible school? Do you know you're responsible? Because some of those kids came from unsaved homes. They have parents who will never learn these things. Your own children, you say, well, I didn't do such a good job, but, but I do get to spend a lot of time with my grandchildren. Can you start now? Parents Day. Train up a child. Instruction. Discipline. Example. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. You are a magnificent God. We call you Father, 
and you as father have given us in the way that you function all of these three legs of the stool you've given us instruction you've given us your word you've given us discipline whom the father loves he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives you've given us example that we could actually see and hear and who could be touched as Jesus God the Son became man and walked among us and we know how he lived and how it revolutionized the entire world as he made an impact on the apostles who gave their very lives to spread the good news about the true and living God thank you father for you have not said do what I say not what I do you have done it that we might know and that we might obey help us now empower us to both understand and to obey for we pray it in Jesus name amen our closing hymn for today